KLBK News at 10. We're all over our neighborhood, our trailer park. It's covered in, covered in smoke. I just am devastated to know that those four children were taken so short in their life. A father in jail tonight after four children were killed. Good evening and thanks so much for joining us on KLBK. I'm Terry Furman. I'm John Hanson. Truly a heartbreaking story. Flames and smoke seen billowing from a trailer in Wolforth last night as fire crews arrived at the scene and now families suffering a terrible loss. 28-year-old Wesley Harvey is charged with abandonment or endangering a minor resulting in death. Armadi Salazar has been following this story and joins us now from 140th Street and County Road 1430. Madi, how old were these children? Really heartbreaking to think about the four lives lost. The youngest just being two years old and the oldest was seven. The warrant says that Harvey had gotten there 20 minutes after fire crews were battling the fire. I'm just so sorry it happened, and I feel so sorry for the mom and dad. This is going to be devastating. Not one child, but four. Court documents show Wesley Harvey was supposed to be home taking care of the four kids who died in Wednesday night's fire. They say Harvey left them alone sleeping in the house. Coming down the alley from that way, you could see all the smoke just rolling out. Like bad. Firefighters got there and were battling the fire for 20 minutes before Harvey arrived home, telling them there were four kids inside. That's when the firefighters went inside to find and save them. When we pull up, we see all like the fire trucks and stuff, and we see the smoke, and then I seen Jerry, and Jerry was like, Yeah, their house, say, Yeah, I burned down. The Lubbock County Sheriff's Department says three of the kids died at the hospital. The smallest child died at the scene of the fire, all of them suffering from serious burns and smoke injuries. One of the kids went to school at Friendship ISD, the school district sending their sincerest condolences to the family. My heart just goes out to those babies. Of course, I know they're in a better place. Me, him, and my little girl are best friends, you know what I'm saying? I just think about my kid. I'm like, I don't even want to tell her. <laughs> like, I like, legit don't even want to tell her. Harvey is in the Lubbock County Jail charged with abandoning or endangering a minor. Just coming to say a prayer. Yeah, say a prayer for the family, and especially for the mom. And the mom's. It's not okay. I'm a mom, so I understand. The mom of the four kids works at a restaurant called Fast Eddie's, and the manager told me that they're working on putting a fundraiser together. There's no set time or date for that fundraiser, but we will be putting those details on our website, everythinglubbock.com. All right, Madi, is there any idea of what sparked the fire in this, have they said? The cause of the fire is still under investigation, but in the warrant, it did say that there was a space heater being used inside the house. All right, thanks so much, Monty. A former Lubbock High School student and senior at West Texas A&M is dead after officials say that he jumped out of a moving car. County police say that Treston Johnson was in a car with friends who said that they were picking him up as part of a fraternity pledge. Well, that's when the friends told police that Johnson jumped out of the car and seriously injured his head. He made such an impact in my life. I can't imagine the kind of impact he made on other people and that he will be very missed by everyone. So. Johnson was a dance major and an active performer at Moonlight Musicals growing up. Hub City Performing Arts School, where Johnson works, says that they will be holding a dance rehearsal in his honor and that everyone is welcome and free to attend. Lubbock voters got behind the Expo Center plan and agreed to allow the funding through an increase in the hotel occupancy tax. Now the steering committee is looking at what they need to do next. Randy Jordan with the steering committee project says they'll finalize the design plan with the architects, but that they can't kick too many things into action until they receive that $50 million they asked for. Once they receive the money, they can purchase a plot of land, most likely at North University and Loop 289. The county has never taken on a project like this, so they'll be working closely with the county commissioners to make sure that they're doing everything right along the way. We need their help, we need their supervision, we need their oversight. But by the same token, the citizens are saying, we don't want the government, we don't want the county to be completely responsible for this. To understand exactly uh, everyone's role in this, so that moving forward we have a clear, well-defined path to ensure that uh, the right things are done at the right time and the right people are doing those things. Those architectural plans will be finalized in the next 90 to 120 days. Then we'll also have a final answer on whether or not they'll be able to use money from the rental car tax in early December. 
The last time Texas had a day without any deadly crashes was the same year that George W. Bush became president. State lawmakers recently passed a law banning texting and driving with a goal to save lives. But as KLBK Steffi Lee shows us, the people behind the law want it cleared up next session. His empty chair at our table is a constant reminder that our family is not complete. For the last 10 years, Jovi Masters has relived the pain of losing her son in the hopes of saving other lives. She crisscrosses the state, sharing how Travis was texting on his phone while driving when he crashed. We all make a choice when we get behind the wheel, and that choice can possibly end up in your death or possibly even killing someone else. His name joins dozens of others on this memorial wall at the Texas Distracted Driving Summit. We get a license to drive, but it's a license to kill if you really don't use it responsibly. Ever since I lost my mom 10 years ago in a crash caused by a driver on their cell phone, you know, I've dedicated my life to this issue. Both Jovi and Jennifer Smith were key forces in getting the state to ban texting while driving. Jennifer says there are now loopholes she wants lawmakers to address. People aren't texting anymore. They're taking, and they're taking that word literally. They're saying, oh, I'm not texting, but they're on Instagram the whole time they're driving or they're Snapchatting. And she wants to see a culture shift. People will pay a fine and not really care that there has to be consequences. People need to understand that there are repercussions from that one simple choice to get behind the wheel and not be focused. In Austin, Steffi Lee, KLBK News. Put the phone down. Investigators are now looking for the club the clues into the move behind the country's latest mass shooting. A gunman opened fire inside a crowded bar in California, killing 12 people before taking his own life. But there is a hero in all of this. A death toll may have been even higher if not for the actions of a sheriff's sergeant who lost his life and is being praised as a hero tonight. Brian Todd has the latest. Within two to three minutes after the initial 911 calls, officers arrived on the scene of the shooting at Borderline Bar and Grill in Thousand Oaks. Sheriff Sergeant Ron Helis charged in along with a California Highway Patrol officer. Sergeant Helis was struck by several bullets and later died of his wounds. He's praised tonight as a hero. We know that once Sergeant Helis and the Highway Patrol officer engaged him, the shooting inside stopped. The sheriff says there were up to 200 people inside the bar and the sergeant's quick intervention saved lives. The clock is ticking uh, the entire time that, that you're responding to an active shooter. Tom Manger, police chief in Montgomery County, Maryland, outside Washington, oversees a force of about 1,300 officers. Manger and other law enforcement veterans say the 1999 mass shooting at Columbine High School in Colorado changed everything as far as how police respond to active shooters. First responding officers um, could hear the shooting continuing and their training, their, their tactic was we got to secure the perimeter and call out the SWAT team. And unfortunately what happened as we, as in hindsight was that the shooting did continue. At Columbine, SWAT teams didn't enter the school until 47 minutes after the gunfire erupted. 12 students and a teacher were killed. Now, in active shooter training scenarios like this one, Many police departments instruct the first arriving officer or officers to rush in. That means don't wait for backup, for SWAT teams, for more firepower. You've got to stop the threat. And whether, if that can be done by distracting the shooter, if it can be done by engaging the shooter, um, the, the, the intent and the purpose and the goal is to stop the shooter. But even now, those tactics aren't always followed. February of this year at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, Officials said one Broward County Sheriff's deputy was on campus when the gunman started firing. The deputy took up a position outside while the shooter was firing, but authorities say he never went in. So what should he have done? Went in, addressed the killer, killed the killer. Seventeen people were killed inside Stoneman Douglas High School. The deputy in question denied the accusations of a poor response. Chief Manger acknowledges charging in early carries enormous risks. The drawback is that um, you're putting officers' lives at risk, but this is, this is something that um, we don't do uh, lightly, we don't do recklessly. I mean, we do train these officers, give them uh, tactical training. Well, it's holiday time. Something to think about. Dozens of new cases of salmonella linked to raw turkey products have sprung up around the country. One person has died. The CDC reports an additional 74 cases of salmonella illness and one death in California. 
since July. 164 people have gotten sick in 35 states. 63 people got so sick that they had to be hospitalized. Many of the people who got sick reported eating or preparing different types of turkey products purchased from multiple locations. The CDC says the outbreak strain has been found in both live turkeys and many kinds of raw turkey products. An estimated 1.2 million salmonella cases occur every year here in the U.S. Symptoms of salmonella infection include diarrhea, fever, and stomach cramps. The symptoms usually develop about 12 to 72 hours after being exposed to the bacteria and last four to seven days, though most people recover without treatment. Canadian researchers say the darker the coffee, the better it may be for your brain. Researchers from the Crimble Brain Institute in Toronto tested Starbucks via instant light roast, dark roast, and decaffeinated dark roast. They were looking for a particular compound known to make coffee bitter. The compound also supposedly prevents two protein fragments common in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's diseases. The researchers found dark roast coffee yields the highest quantities of the compound. They say that would seemingly make it the best pick for brain health. One expert believes that you should take this study with a side of skepticism. A researcher at the Crimble Brain Institute admits the study does not suggest that coffee is a cure. Well, I always say it's never too early to think about what's for dessert. And with that in mind, this is the 27th year for Meals on Wheels Easiest Pie Fundraiser. Now, I'll actually be kicking off this year's event with the annual pie eating contest tomorrow alongside Brittany Escobar. And then it's your turn. Just donate $5 at any Lubbock United supermarket, and then you'll get a coupon for a free Mrs. Smith's pie. All the money raised goes to our friends with Meals on Wheels to help them feed folks on the South Plains who are homebound and elderly. And they always need volunteers for this uh, easiest visit you'll ever make. No, I think more people should do this, you know, because it only takes an hour out of your time, just one hour out of one day, and mm -hmm. uh, you'll get rewarded in so many ways. Yeah, and, and you mm -hmm. really appreciate it, you know, the, yeah. our client hey, look forward to, to seeing it. To seeing us, and that makes us feel good too. So, I mean, this is a win-win. Make a donation, get a pie. That's my kind of ratio right there. And then take part in the Meals on Wheels program if you can. Now, we've got information on our website, everythinglubbock.com. And it's a great fundraiser, a great yes. activity. So, And we'll be airing it live at noon yep. tomorrow. So you're going to want to watch he and Brittany eat lots of pie. It'll be a blast. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, Sunday is Veterans Day. To commemorate the day, veterans organizations are breaking ground on the Monument of Courage. Yeah, that'll be at 11 o'clock that morning at the Lubbock Area Veterans War Memorial. Everyone's invited to stand in honor of all veterans, Gold Star families, Purple Heart recipients, and nine regional Medal of Honor recipients. Now, another way to honor our veterans and active military is to turn on your porch light this Saturday at sunset and and then leave that on through the night until sunrise on Monday morning. It was a big day for veteran Michael Vasquez and his family. The war veteran received a new home thanks to the West Texas Home Builders Association. Vasquez was injured while serving in Afghanistan. His new home fully accessible for his wheelchair, and they have lots of amenities for the family. The best part of all of this is that the whole thing is mortgage free. I mean, so that's congratulations a, yeah, to the a family. small gift compared to what he gave for us. Right. That's awesome. All right, there's still more news headed your way. Which exotic animals officials had to literally wrestle out of this poem? But first, Heidi, what do you snow about the forecast? <laughs> There is a chance for some possible snow. We'll talk about that coming up. But today, obviously, pretty chilly out there, and it's only going to stay cold for tomorrow. We're looking at 49 for your high, 40 for your low today, 67 and 39 were the average. And, of course, we see the cool down continue. Details coming up.
now meteorologist Heidi Wagner with KLBK's First Warning Weather. Good evening, everyone. Happy Friday Eve to you. It was a nice day, but a chilly day across the region. And as we move into tomorrow, not seeing too much of a change. Outside right now, it's getting a little foggy, a little misty out there. Don't be surprised if that sticks around through tomorrow morning. We are expecting that. As we move into your Friday evening, though, we will start to see a few of the clouds clear out and a little bit of a break from the rain, the clouds, and those kind of damp conditions outside. You can see a few showers, though, developing over New Mexico. Those will slide in overnight tonight, so we do have a 20% chance of rain this evening. Temperatures will stay cool for the next few days. We're at 47 tomorrow, 50 for Saturday, and then we bump up to 58. Still way below average for this time of year, but a lot warmer than what we've been seeing over the past few days. And then notice that cool down Sunday into Monday, and that is the big window we're watching because we are expecting freezing temperatures in between, and of course, we are looking at that chance for precip, which means wintry precip is possible. Won't last for long. We do see temperatures start to heat up by Tuesday, but of course, something you want to keep in mind as you make your plans for the beginning of next week. As mentioned, might see a little rain tonight, early tomorrow morning, then it clears out. We get a break until Sunday night. Now showing up at 11.59 p.m. Earlier today, showing up around 9 p.m. So again, timing can change. But it is showing the pink and the white and the purple colors, which signify freezing rain, sleet, and snow. And it starts late Sunday and really becomes widespread across the region Monday morning and even into Monday afternoon. We'll see cloud cover stick around as well. So you want to keep in mind as we move into early Monday morning, you're going to want to make sure you're staying up to date on the forecast. Of course, you're going to want to leave with plenty of time to spare. Slow down. And again, this weekend, maybe fill up with a little bit earlier. Make sure your car is prepped and ready just in case we do see that snow. And of course, we are going to see conditions clear out by the afternoon, but not really a lot of time for the snow and the precip to evaporate, which means icy conditions as we head into your Tuesday morning. That's something we definitely want people to be on the lookout for. This is just one model for snow accumulation as we head into this upcoming Monday. It is showing a decent amount of snow for many locations. Southern County is showing as little as 17 hundredths of an inch in Seminole, 13 hundredths in Denver City, but up to 2.9 inches in Dimmit, 3.41 in Tulia, 2.22 in Plainview, and 1.67 in Lubbock. Again, this is not a guarantee. It is just a certain model that is showing a little bit of snow across the region. Again, that is going to impact your travel plans, so keep that in mind. 33 degrees is also your temperature for tonight, so many folks will reach freezing and it may get even a little bit chillier for a few of you compared to what we will see here in Lubbock, but you do want to bring those pets and potted plants indoors. And of course, taking a look at your Texas Tech forecast, 48 degrees for your kickoff temperature on Saturday night. So chilly next few days. We warm up a little bit for Veterans Day, but the big headline is Sunday into Monday, where we are watching for John's favorite thing in the world, snow. <laughs> if it if it snows an inch, I'm going to bring my sled to work and I'll show it to everybody. I'm so. not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> They're not very excited either. So. <laughs> Animal control workers in Kansas City, Missouri, were called to a house to deal with some exotic pets that belonged to a renter that was being evicted from the home. Yeah, when they got inside, they encountered a four-year-old alligator that weighed more than 200 pounds. Emily Rittman <laughs> has that story. Yeah, he'll wear down and then he'll, then he'll slow down. Shortly after this video was taken, a snare pole was used to help safely close the alligator's mouth. The alligator was lifted into a truck to be transported to the sanctuary. The alligator's owner, Sean Casey, said he tried to calm the reptile. The animal control people could have just jiggled his harness and he would have been smiling, ready to go outside. Casey said he is upset with the person in charge of the family trust who evicted him, three pythons, a rabbit, and his alligator. I got him when he was about this big. Yeah. Um, uh, he was two pounds. And I'm just, I'm. He's been, my, he's been like my dog ever since. Dana Savarelli with Monkey Island Rescue says many people purchase alligators and don't realize just how large they can get. He's making room for catfish at his sanctuary. Problem is you can't keep put these guys together. You can't really throw them all in together. They'll be fighting like dinosaurs. I'll fight to get him back. Animal control investigators say because alligators are prohibited in Kansas City, the alligator won't be returned. 
Not a yeah. good pet in my book. So N none of them I like really that he, I like that he was like, you know, just jingle his harness. Oh yeah, he'll come, he'll come right, right with along. you. He's like my dog. So <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> mm, all right, more news still to come here on KLBK. How college students in San Antonio are getting a hand up when it comes to doing their best in class. Welcome back. A lot of college students face challenges that are far more serious than just picking the right major and acing a hard test. Yeah, San Antonio College says 11% of its students have nowhere to call home. Yeah, Erica Zucco was on campus today with what they did to actually help out those students. Students can come and get campus attire. Um, we also have uh, scrubs and lab coats for students who have internships and can't afford. What they call the magic closet is just one way San Antonio College hopes the Student Advocacy Center will help students make ends meet. Noe Gonzalez once needed the school's food pantry, something he had a tough time admitting. Trying to keep it a secret or not, we're not wanting others to know about the food insecurity. But it helped him bridge the gap so he could pay his bills and get through school. Now he's working, studying more, and interning here to pay it forward. They need to be able to, to have the food that they need to be healthy, to be able to get the academic success in their studies. President Robert Vela says they've had a center like this in place for two years, but this grand reopening offers more resources and a space designed so students don't feel like they're getting a handout. Rather, they're giving each other a hand up. It's about a point of pride, so everything around the center is centered around excellence to ensure that students walk away saying, I am simply here with family and we're all here to help each other pull through so that we can all achieve our academic personal and career goals. With 11% of students facing homelessness and around 40% who can't pay for food, hygiene, and medicine many of us take for granted, they plan to help hundreds. Good for them. Now, the school hopes that other college campuses will learn from this and the concept of a student advocacy center will actually catch on. That's such a neat program because the last thing you think that, you know, they're going through college that they're homeless or insecure food wise, but they are. Costs so a lot they they, they of money. need that help. That's really neat. So. All right. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Sports is next.
Now, KLBK's local sports connection with Paul Tums. Time to crown a district champ. Good evening and welcome to your Sports Connection. The Estacado Matadors and Leveland Lobos with a lot more than just bragging rights on the line tonight to kick off the final weekend of games for the regular season, two for a Division II title and an all-important seeding game for the postseason. Dalvion Rhodes and the Mats squaring off against Chris Gerber and the Lobos, and it was a brisk fall night. First quarter, Gerber's pass is going to be picked here by Cam Rollison. And you know what? There were actually four interceptions. Two of them didn't count because there was offsides against Estacado. Here's the other interception that we got. Tadrian Ward. That's going to set up the next possession for Estacado. And it's Seth Porter time. And Seth, well, you know, he knows what to do with the ball when he gets it. He's going to take this one to the house. 57 yards, he rumbles. And he had over 100 yards just in the first half alone. Second quarter now. It's Jeremiah Dobbins' turn to get in on the action, and he would do just that. Yeah, all night is exactly it. He gets in on this one. This one's going to go for about 28 yards to 30 yards, somewhere in that neighborhood. And it's 14 to nothing, Estacado. Leveland would have to settle for two field goals in the first half. It would be 14 6. We jet ahead to the second half. Game is now tied in the fourth. Chris Gerber, third and one from the 20, breaks a tackle, takes it the distance. It's 27 to 20 Lobos, and Estacado falls in this one. The final score is 27 to 20. Heck of a game, and of course, a district title for the Lobos. Let's go, of course, to some basketball news. Chris Beard adding to his team for the 2019 2020 season. Today, getting a commitment from four star guard. Jamius Ramsey out of Duncanville, a 6'4 guard. The Panthers helped them lead them to the 6A regional quarterfinals in 2017. 11 and 3, 26 and 8 record. Ramsey chose the Red Raiders over a slew of other teams, including Memphis, Indiana, and Louisville. This is the second consecutive season Texas Tech has been able to snag a 100 prospect. Last year, getting freshman forward Devon Moore. Ramsey is ranked as ESPN's number 28 overall prospect in the country. Says he chose Tech because it was in state, and of course he was impressed by what Coach Beard and his staff were able to do last year, getting all the way to the lead eight. And Zaire Smith, you know, getting drafted number ten, kind of played an overall role and you in just that said, decision. You just said the year 2020 on TV, like I you did. That we're talking I, and about it was that. it was just rather a matter of yeah. fact, but we're really to that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, busy day tomorrow, right? We obviously, not have lots tomorrow. of high school, yeah. but it's not. Yeah, exactly. Texas the whole Tech weekend, as well. Texas Tech, of course, we have men's and women's basketball. Women start the season. Soccer plays as well. LCU starts basketball, and they have volleyball. Wow. Lots to yeah. talk about. Good luck. You got. It. We'll be right back. <laughs>
That does it for us. We'll see you tomorrow.